So, the, a few videos ago, we talked about how to make this picture, right? How to be given some information and turn it into a picture. And really what I tried to stress is sort of what that picture means, what it tells you, what, if you're asked a given question, how you can draw a picture that answers that question. And then we spent quite a bit of time using the empirical rule to kind of answer those questions, to figure out how much area there was shaded in a given region. Probably more important than figuring out those areas is really being comfortable with the picture itself. But we spent several videos using the empirical rule try to find, trying to find given shaded regions. Now that you're good with that, turns out there's a, I don't know if better is the right word. Eh, better is the right word. There's a better way to find these areas. You're supposed to learn the empirical rule. It's a good way to ballpark areas. It's a good way to get some intuition to, for this picture, which is really important. But it turns out there's a better way. And what do I mean a better way? Well, the first comment I have is recall when we first started talking about the empirical rule, this word. Right? These are all approximations. It's not true that 68% of the area uh, underneath the normal distribution lies within one standard deviation of the mean. Pretty close to 68. I don't remember exactly what it is. It's like 67 point something or 68 point something. It's really close to this. We can calculate that as this video goes on, maybe if we've got time at the end. Uh, but the point is, these are just approximations. If you want a more precise answer, you can use your calculator. And it turns out that your calculator isn't as restricted as these empirical rule questions are. Like, imagine you wanted to know um, on what percentage of nights I sleep between seven and nine and three quarters hours. You couldn't use the empirical rule for that because seven does not correspond with negative one, negative two, negative three, one, two, three, or zero Z scores. Right? Neither does, what did I say, nine and three quarters? All the questions that I've been asking about the empirical rule had to involve values who have Z scores that are either zero, plus or minus one, two, or three. But what if that's not what your question is? So two different things that our calculator can do that we couldn't do with the empirical rule. It can give you more precise answers and it can answer a wider range of questions. And that might beg the question, if the calculator is so much better, why did I ever learn the empirical rule to begin with? And the short answer is because if you just start out with the calculator functions, then they don't have any meaning. It's sort of that black box idea where you, type, you memorize what you put in and what comes out, but you don't really understand any of it. So every intro to statistics class I've ever seen starts with the empirical rule, then goes on to calculator functions. That's what we're doing now. Turns out there's two different calculator functions. One of them is called the normal CDF calculator function, and one of them is called the inverse norm calculator function. And we'll be using both of those calculator functions in place of the empirical rule. And they're different enough that I want to split them up into two different videos. So in this video, I'm only going to talk about normal CDF. And then the next video, maybe we're going to talk about inverse norm. So how does the normal CDF function work in your calculator? Well, first we need a question. So we could pick any of these questions, whichever one you like the best. I mean, we could make new questions if we wanted. But why reinvent the wheel? Let's redo this problem. Redo this. So as you may recall... This was talking about the amount of sleep I get on a given night, and it said that the mean was eight, and the standard deviation was one and a half. And you were told to assume that the number of hours I get is approximately normally distributed. So when we draw our distribution, it kind of looks like this. And I throw eight in the middle, and I count up and down by whatever the standard deviation is. In this case, it's one and a half. That kind of gives me this picture that I'm making very slowly for whatever reason. Good enough. And then the question can ask whatever you want the question to ask. Maybe suppose the question says, what, on what percentage of nights do I sleep between five and 12 and a half hours? Maybe they ask this question right here. And what we learn is we can estimate that answer with the empirical rule. But maybe you don't want an estimation. Maybe you want a more precise answer. So let's redo this question. We can still draw the picture. And it would still look the same. I'd start at 5, I'd go out here to 12 and a half, and I'd shade in this region. Because going back to the first of the videos in this chapter, we talked about how the area under the curve has two different interpretations. And one of them is the percentage of all observations that fall within that range. And then before, when using the empirical rule, we had to use a lot of math to figure out, get kind of clever how to find the different areas. Now we don't have to. Now we can just tell our calculator... Hey, calculator, I want to know what this area is. There's a calculator function. It's called the normal CDF calculator function. And I'm going to write it down here because you're going to need extra information about it. And you always use it to find 
the area under a normal curve. And that's exactly what we have in this question. It doesn't say how much area is there under the curve between 5 and 12 and a half, but you're good enough with your interpretations of the area under the curve that you recognize that that's what this question right here is asking. And when you're trying to find the area underneath the curve, use the normal CDF function. The normal CDF function takes four inputs. Those four inputs are always lower bound, upper bound, center, and spread. And in this section, not for the entire class, but in this section, taking the role of the center will always be mu, the mean, the population mean, eight in this case, and taking the role of the spread will be sigma, the population standard deviation. So in this case, one and a half. But to be clear, I don't write mu and sigma as these two arguments because later in the class, it won't be mu and sigma in these places. It'll be other things that represent the center and the spread. And that'll be super confusing if you write lower bound, upper bound, mu, sigma instead of lower bound, upper bound, center, spread. So you wanna write it this way, trust me. So first off, where do you find the normal CDF function in your calculator? Probably guessing it's under the stat menu, it's not. Like, oh weird, it's under stat plots? No, it's not there either. It's under a third menu that we haven't seen yet in this class. The way you can keep track of what it is, is we're studying the normal distribution. Your calculator knows a lot about a lot of distributions. One of them is the normal distribution, and it knows about them in the distribution menu. There's a menu that says distribution. If you're looking for it, you can't find it. It's kind of hidden. It's above this variables key up in blue here. If I hit second and then variables, it takes me to that distribution. And what I want to do is find the normal CDF calculator function. Note that there's one that says normal PDF. That means something different. You'll never use it in this class. It's normal CDF that you want. And if you hit enter, one of two things will happen. If you have a, um, a newer calculator, a calculator with more recent software on it, you'll see a screen that looks like this. If you don't, and you go into the distribution menu and you hit normal CDF, it'll just say, all right, you're trying to use normal CDF. Tell me the four arguments. So the advantage here is if you have the newer version, you don't have to have memorized that it's waiting for lower bound, upper bound, center, and spread because it kind of gives you prompts for those things. Lower means lower bound, upper means upper bound. Confusingly, although it works out great now, in the next chapter it's gonna be super confusing that it says mu here because it doesn't always want mu, it wants whatever your center is. It just happens to be mu right now. And then it wants whatever your spread is. That just happens to be sigma right now. So it says lower, upper, mu, sigma. I recommend you think about this as lower, upper, center, and spread. And then you put those arguments into your calculator. So for this specific problem to find this area, if I have the fancy version of the calculator, just tell it my lower bound is five and my upper bound is 12 and a half. And my center, I know it says mu, think it says center is eight. And my spread, I know it says sigma, think spread is 1.5. Go down here and hit paste. When you hit enter, it'll show up in this view, which is exactly what the other calculator is waiting for. All right, normal CDF, it's waiting. You have to know that it's waiting for the lower bound, which is five. And then comma, you have to understand that it's waiting for the upper bound, which is 12.5. And then the center, which is eight. And then the spread, which is 1.5. So one way or another, you get to this screen. You don't have to close the parentheses here. You can if you want. You hit enter, it'll spit out the answer on both calculators. And you'll see that it's the same answer. 97. 0.97589999. Okay, so I don't know, maybe we round to four decimal places. If we round to four decimal places, we get, I guess I don't need two calculators, 0.9759. So this answer is 0 0.9759 if I round to four decimal places. Note if you format this as a percentage, if you move the decimal place two spots to the right to make it a percentage, you get 97.59%. That's different than what we got up here. Because up here we thought it was 97.35%. But it's not really 97.35%. It's a lot closer to this. But they're close, right? 97.59 versus 97.35. They're really close, but this one's a little bit more precise. What I recommend you do when you're doing these problems is make note of the calculator function that you're using and then all of its inputs. So tell your grader that you put in normal CDF, 5, 12.5, 8, 
1.5. And then that gave you this, and then that gave you this. Because imagine from her perspective, if you have these all right, except you flip two of these around or something. 5, 8, 12.5, 1.5. Or instead of 12.5, you put in 125. Or instead of 8, you put in 0.8. Or who knows? Who knows what little mistake somebody could make? If you make a little mistake, it's going to throw this answer off. If you don't show your work where this answer came from, how's she going to know? Right? She's going to have no idea how close you are, and she won't be able to give you the credit that you deserve. So show the grader what you're doing so that in case this is off, you could still get full credit. And I'll tell you to do that. Be like, use a calculator function and tell all the different inputs that you're using. So I think what I'm going to do on this week's quiz is I'll ask you the same question twice. Like I'll ask you this question and then this question. And for this one, I'll say use the empirical rule to estimate the answer. And then for this one, I'll say use calculator functions to come up with a more precise answer. You can kind of do that twice. A um, couple minor things I want to add. Let's see if I can find a good example. I don't think I have any good examples on this one, but maybe you recall from the practice video sheet that we did that sometimes you saw a question like, um, what is the probability that? That's our second interpretation of the area. I sleep more than, I don't know, 10 hours on a given night. What you're supposed to know about this is, oh, the probability that one randomly selected observation falls in that range is my second interpretation of the area underneath the curve. So there's my curve. I still have eight in the middle. I count up by one and a half still because I still am working under these assumptions. Where are they? Suppose my nightly sleep is approximately normal with the mean of eight and a standard deviation of 1.5. So I'm still working under those assumptions. So the eight's in the middle, there's nine and a half, here's 11 out here, and here's 12 and a half, and then six and a half, five, and three and a half. Sleep more than 10 hours. So for the first time, I'm asking about a question that doesn't show up down here as one, two, three standard deviations above or below the mean. 10, nine and a half is here and 11's here. I don't know, 10 somewhere in here. That would be a big deal if I was using the empirical rule. But it's not a big deal at all using the calculator functions. Calculator function doesn't care. You're still going to use the normal CDF function. My lower bound is 10. Oh, but now we got a problem. What's your upper bound? Right? There is no upper bound in this problem. What do you do when you're missing an upper bound? The short answer is you just trick your calculator. Just put in a big number. What big number? It doesn't matter. If I say, what's the probability that I sleep between 10 and 999 hours? It's basically the same as more than 10. Just pick some number that would be way the heck out here to the right so that it acts as though there is no upper bound. What I typically do is put in a bunch of nines. What typically you're taught to do is use scientific notation. It doesn't matter. Any large number will be totally fine. 10, a bunch of nines, whatever large number you want. And then the center, which is 8. And then the spread, which is 1.5. You type that all into your calculator. So second, and then distribution. If you have the user-friendly version, it'll ask you for those four things. Otherwise, you just got to put them in with commas in between. The lower bound is 10. Again, it doesn't matter that it's not one of these numbers in red. Type in whatever you want here. The upper bound, bunch of nines. Doesn't matter how many. Doesn't matter how big it is. Sigma, st uh, The center is still eight, and the spread is still 1.5. Hit enter, and it tells me that's 0 .0912. If I tell you to round to four decimal places, you could say that is 9.12%. That's typically what I'll do. I'll say format your answer as a percentage rounded to two decimal places. So it's like the decimal to four, the percentage to two. Um, this is what we'd be looking for. The purpose of this second example is if you're missing an upper bound, just put in a bunch of nines. Yeah, but what if I'm missing a lower bound? Same thing. Except put in a number that's way out here. Instead of a number that's way out here in your distribution, put a number that's way out here. What do you mean, like zero? Okay, from a practical point of view, zero would be fine because you can't sleep less than zero hours. But in order to make sure that you don't ever lose credit on a homework problem that's being really picky, when you're missing a lower bound, don't put in zero for the lower bound. Put in negative and then a bunch of nines just to be safe. All right. So if I said, what is the probability that I sleep less than 10 hours. 
won't even draw the whole picture this time. 10 is somewhere out here. That's not a 10. 10 is somewhere out here because 8's right here. Less than 10. We'll be talking about this region over here. To figure out the area of that shaded region, I'm going to use normal CDF. This time it's my lower bound that's missing. My lower bound, negative, and then just a bunch of 9's is fine. Upper bound will be 10. Center would be 8. Spread would be 1.5. Type that all into your calculator. Something to be careful of here. When you're trying to put in negative and then a bunch of nines, don't put minus 9999 because some of your calculators will get an error. They'll be like, what do you mean? What? This is the subtraction key, not the negative key. So use this key, the negative key, and then a bunch of nines. Some of your calculators are smart enough to know what you meant, but just in case. Type in these same values or just as numbers with commas in between them and hit enter. And here's our answer, 90.88% if you round it, if you format it as a decimal, sorry, format it as a percentage, rounded to two decimal places. That is how you use the normal CDF function on your calculator. Uh, what I'll show you in the next video is there's another calculator function called inverse norm. And you'll see that neither one on its own is that hard to use, but the real challenge is telling when you use one versus the other. So maybe spend an extra minute understanding why these questions are asking you to find the area underneath the curve because that'll end up being the key to this whole thing.